Hello, everyone. Let's start today's seminar. We are very glad to have Professor Edward Lucky Core from the University of Chicago. He will give an interesting talk about gravitational particle production in the early universe. Early universe. Please start when you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, happy to be talking uh, to you in Seoul. And um, <clears throat> I'd like you to imagine the impossible. I think that's a, that's a great saying. And, um, Maybe it's not so impossible. So I will talk about gravitational particle production in the early universe. And, um, right. So the idea behind gravitational particle production is that an external field can create particles from the vacuum. And this was first pointed out in a cosmological setting by Schrodinger in 1939, and I'll say a little bit about his 1939 paper. It's a well-known phenomenon in uh, QED that strong electric fields can create particles. This is called the Schwinger effect, uh, and Schwinger wrote the final paper about this in 1951. And external gravitational field can create particles from the vacuum from Hawking radiation from black holes. But I will concentrate on time-dependent gravitational fields, in particular, the Big Bang. And by the Big Bang, I will assume that it, the universe started in a quasi de phase of inflation, followed by a transition to a matter-dominated phase, then a radiation-dominated phase, Although perhaps if there's time, I'll talk about some recent work we've done in uh, the quasi de Sitter phase transitioning to uh, kinetian phase where the, radi where the uh, universe is dominated by the kinetic energy of a scalar field. So gravitational particle production is an example of quantum field theory in a classical gravitational background there are many in interesting facets about QFT in uh, gravitational background, but my motivation is to explore whether gravitational particle production can be the origin of dark matter and whether it can provide cosmological, cosmological constraints on BSM physics. <clears throat> now, I won't go into the evidence for dark matter. It's uh, well covered by many people, and I believe it's probably well known to everyone in the audience. And also well known to everyone in the audience is that for the past 40 years or so, the leading dark matter candidate has been a weak scale cold thermal relic. And this weak scale relic, dark matter, has, would have a mass between a GeV and a TeV, and would have weak scale interactions with the standard model particles. It has no self interactions of note today. And it is produced by a freeze out mechanism from the primordial plasma. And it is cold. The velocity is, um, is uh, not important. And one of the wonderful things about this idea is that the weak scale thermal relic is detectable several ways by direct detection, by indirect detection, by the decay products or annihilation products and production at colliders. And another wonderful thing about it is it is just beyond the standard model of particle physics. So it has nothing to do with Planck scale physics or uh, physics at the string scale, grand unified scale, or anything like that. It would involve physics just beyond the standard model. So these, this is a wonderful idea, but unfortunately, the weak scale cold thermal relic has not been seen, at least convincingly seen. It hasn't been seen in direct detection. Now, there's always the Dama Libra question. Uh, it has not been seen in indirect detection. There's a galactic center excess, 
uh, in gamma rays that is not completely understood and may be a signal of dark matter annihilation. It has not been seen in decay of the relic particles. Now there's a 3.5 keV gamma ray line that uh, people talk about as a possible signal of decay of dark matter. And it hasn't been seen in colliders and or accelerators. And in fact, colliders or accelerators to me has not seen any signal beyond the standard model. Now, uh, G minus two of the muon and the mass of the W reports from Fermilab may turn out to be something, but it hasn't been convincingly seen. So this leads us to raise a question, perhaps dark matter does not interact with standard model particles or to say it another way, it interacts only gravitationally. So I want to explore the possibility that dark only gravitationally. Well, if it interacts only gravitationally, gravity must play a role in its cosmological production, but gravity is weak. So how can gravitational particle production produce dark matter? Well, there are several ideas and one I will concentrate on. One idea is through something that's known as the misalignment mechanism. So the equation of motion of a scalar field is written here. And uh, during inflation, a scalar field has quantum fluctuations. So the dispersion of the scalar field is essentially H over two pi where H is the expansion rate during inflation. So generally the scalar field would not sit at the minimum of the potential, but would be displaced by a value approximately H over two pi. Once inflation ends, the inflaton, this inflation, uh, this field would be, after inflation, the field would be frozen by Hubble drag, this term in the equation of motion, until the expansion rate of the universe drops to approximately or below the mass of this scalar field. And after that, it oscillates about the minimum of the potential with an energy density in the oscillating field. And an example of dark matter production through this misalignment mechanism is the axion. Now, um, there are other ways, it doesn't have to be the axions, there are other particles where you might imagine of uh, the misalignment mechanism producing dark matter. <clears throat> Another idea for gravitational particle production is to produce particles through Hawking radiation from primordial black holes. This has recently been proposed by three of my colleagues from Fermilab. And the idea is there are primordial black holes that are formed in the early universe. They're not large enough to survive to be the dark matter today. They evaporate. But in the evaporation of black holes, you can produce particles that only have gravitational interactions. And um, the estimate for the value of omega h squared in a dark matter particle that's produced by primordial black hole evaporation depends upon the mass of the, of the uh, dark matter particle. It depends upon the temperature of the universe when evaporation occurs, and it depends upon the efficiency of black hole production in the early universe. And these are representative values for those parameters that are in this paper by Hooper et al. And um, you see that omega h squared of 0.12, which is the value we want for dark matter is possible uh, for the masses around 10 to the 11 GeV, temperature of 10 to the 12 and efficiency of 10 to the minus 16. Now primordial black holes are of current interest seems to me that every 10 years or so, there's a great deal of interest in primordial black holes, then it dies away, then there's a great deal of interest. It's sort of a, a periodic signal in the interest uh, in primordial black holes. The seeds from primordial black holes can be put down from inflation. 
And for this to be a viable dark matter candidate, it assumes the dark matter mass is about 10 to the 11 GeV. And masses in this range, I will refer to as a Wimpzilla. So a Wimpzilla is a very massive dark matter candidate. And by very massive, I mean it's too massive to be a cold thermal relic. And that means the mass must be larger than about 200 TeV, but often 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 GeV will come up as a potential dark matter mass. So this is what I mean by a Wimpscilla. So <clears throat> how else might dark matter be produced only gravitationally? Well, um, it's possible to produce dark matter particles from the standard model plasma via gra graviton exchange. And um, uh, Garney, Sandora, and Sloth looked at this recently and calculated omega h squared. And again, 0 0.12 is the value we would want for it to be dark matter. Assuming the annihilation cross-section times the flux is the temperature squared over the Planck mass to the fourth, each of these vertices would be one over Planck mass, so the cross-section would be one over the Planck mass to the fourth. And uh, for this to work, you have to have a mass of 10 to the 13 GeV and a reheat temperature after inflation of 10 to the 14 GeV. Of course, you can trade off the mass and the reheat temperature to have omega h squared of 0.12. <clears throat> this is not a freeze out calculation, it's freeze in. The particles never obtain their equilibrium abundance. And this works for dark matter mass about 10 to the 13 GeV, which is a Wimpzilla. And it assumes that the mass of the dark matter has to be smaller than the reheat temperature. Otherwise, there would not be enough energy for particle in the standard model plasma to produce dark matter. Another idea is to produce particles from the inflaton field, not from the uh, primordial plasma, but from the inflaton field after the quasi de Sitter era via, again, graviton exchange. And this was first proposed by Emma, Nakayama, and Tang, and later Mambrini and Ala looked at it. So after inflation, they appreciated that there's a cold condensate of inflaton particles, and this cold inflaton particles in this cold condensate can interact through gravity and produce dark matter. Now this will only work for dark matter mass smaller than the inflaton mass. If the dark matter is too massive, since the inflatons are cold, then there won't be enough center of momentum energy to produce the dark matter. The dark matter mass for a correct value of omega h squared to be the dark matter involve function of several parameters. So there's not a clean one figure uh, I can show. And this is a Boltzmann approach for calculating the dark matter abundance. Uh, but uh, Kaneda, Lee and Oda have recently pointed out that this is not a complete treatment. And uh, when we do later toward the end of the talk, I'll talk about producing dark matter from the cold inflaton condensate. And this is a combination of Schrodinger and Bogliubov. And the Boltzmann approach is a subset of this. All right, so uh, the idea of producing particles just by the expansion of the universe is what I will uh, discuss. And this was first pointed out by Schrodinger in a paper titled the proper, <clears throat> excuse me, the proper vibrations of the expanding universe. This paper was published in, in October, 1939 in Physica. Uh, this paper has a rather interesting citation history. For the first 20 years after the paper was published, it was never cited. Uh, and 
to date, at least uh, at the end of the last decade, it had been it had been cited 268 times, and most of the cite the citation history is growing, and I'll be interested to see uh, what the next decade will bring. No author affiliation is listed for Schrodinger. In fact, he was a refugee and uh, in the Second World War, uh, escaping the Nazis. So let's, uh, I'll say a little bit about Schrodinger's paper because it has some interesting points. He was the first person to uh, come up with the concept of particle creation just by the expansion of the universe. Some of the technical details in this paper are not correct, but still the idea is there. So uh, early in the paper, Schrodinger writes that the decomposition of an arbitrary wave function into proper vibrations is rigorous. Now, I will translate that to mean even in, in an expanding universe, a particle's wave function can be decomposed into what he calls proper vibrations, which uh, you can take to mean positive and negative energy modes. So the wave function can be written as in terms of the positive and negative frequency modes. Then Schrodinger goes on to point out the key fact that these two proper vibrations cannot be rigorously separated in the expanding universe. That means to say that if in a certain moment of time, only one of them is present, the other one can turn up in the course of time. So if you start with pure incoming or outgoing waves, in and out may become mixed just due to the expansion of the universe. Schrodinger writes, generally speaking, this is a phenomenon of outstanding importance. With particles, it would mean production or annihilation of matter merely by the expansion. So the phenomenon, Schrodinger thinks is of outstanding importance that the expansion of the universe creates particles. And then he says, alarmed by these prospects, I have investigated the question in more detail. So Schrodinger writes, this alarms me. My editorial comment is why, he never says why it alarms him. So this alarms me, so he wrote a paper. All right, the final thing I'll mention in this paper is toward the conclusion is there will thus be a mutual adulteration of positive and negative frequency terms in the course of time, giving rise to what in the introduction I call the alarming phenomenon. In this paper, Schrodinger's two favorite phrases were alarming phenomenon and adulteration. So what was Schrodinger alarmed about? Well, if you would go back in 1939, there was a lot for Schrodinger to be alarmed about, but he seemed to be alarmed by the possibility of the creation of a particle, of a single particle per Hubble time, per Hubble volume with a Hubble energy. So every 10 to the 10 years, somewhere in 10 to the 57 cubic centimeters, there could appear a particle with an energy of 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. This doesn't particularly alarm me, maybe it would alarm you. So of all of the circumstances faced by Schrodinger in 1939, why did this alarm him? Okay, how do we understand the creation of particles by the expansion of the universe? It is an example of disturbing the quantum vacuum by an external field. Something that's probably more familiar is the Schwinger effect, where a sufficiently strong electric field can create particles from the vacuum. So if you imagine in the vacuum, Without an electric field, there's a, electrons and positrons in, this, in the vacuum, virtual positrons and electrons. However, in the presence of an electric field, you could imagine the electric field accelerating the negatively charged electron in one direction and the positively charged electron in another direction. 
And if particle creation would be possible, if the energy gained in acceleration from the E field over a Compton wavelength exceeds the particle's rest mass. Now, the only dimensionful parameter here is the electron mass. So the critical, and you can do a calculation, but the critical value of the electric field is the electron mass squared. And this turns out to be about 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter. So this is a tremendously strong electric field. Nothing that electric field like this cannot be produced in the laboratory. However, with uh, very high power lasers, possibly in the future, um, if you have a laser with an intensity of 10 to the 30 watt centimeter squared, you can produce particles from the vacuum. Or if you have a magnetic, a large magnetic field, then you have large electric fields. If you would have a magnetic field of about five times 10 to the 13 Gauss, you can create particles from the vacuum. Now, five times 10 to the 13 Gauss is not obtainable in the laboratory, but there are astrophysical situations where there are magnetic fields of that magnitude, and perhaps in magnetars and things like that, this phenomenon occurs. So this is something that's well understood in QED. Uh, the fact that it was possible was first proposed by Sauter and Heisenberg and Euler, and Weisskopf worked on it, <clears throat> and uh, Julian Schwinger in 1951 put the final touches on it. So a strong external electric field can create particles from the vacuum. And uh, thinking of this, you can maybe understand how the expansion of the universe can lead to particle creation. So uh, you can imagine an, an electron and a positron coming out of the vacuum being caught in the expansion of space. So they're being pulled apart due to the expansion of space. And you can have particle creation if the energy gained an acceleration from the expansion of space over a Compton wavelength exceeds the particle's rest mass. So it has to be relativistic and the expansion velocity is equal to C at the Hubble radius. So you think there might be a critical value of the expansion of the universe that's equal to the mass. And this essentially is Schrodinger's alarming phenomena from 1939. So in 1939, Schrodinger said, this is of outstanding importance. He said, again, generally speaking, this is a phenomenon of outstanding importance. With particles, it would mean the production or annihilation of matter merely by the expansion. He doesn't say why that would be of outstanding importance. So after 1939, this paper was forgotten in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, also by Schrodinger. Uh, the idea of gravitational particle production was first taken up after Schrodinger's paper by Leonard Parker in his thesis in 1966. And Parker is really responsible for the resurgence of interest in gravitational particle production. He wrote a paper in 1968 where he said, for the early stages of a Friedman expansion, it, particle creation, may well be of great cosmological significance, especially since it seems inescapable if one accepts quantum field theory and general relativity. That's true, but Parker has no speculation as to the great cosmological significance. The first attempt of finding a cosmological application was Zeldovich in the 70s, who proposed an application to explain why the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. This did not work. We now understand homogeneity and isotropy as being due to inflation. <clears throat> There was other interest in the 70s. This was mostly regarded as a curiosity. 
There was interest in the US and the Soviet Union and the UK. Finally, there was a great cosmological significance to gravitational particle creation, and that is the density perturbations in inflation. Uh, but could there be more? Gravitational particle production is universal, <clears throat> but it's not a large effect. The curvature perturbations produced by gravitational particle production is only 10 to the minus five in amplitude. What else could be observable? Dark matter, I will concentrate on CMB isocurvature perturbations and CMB non-Gaussianities. I will concentrate on dark matter and talk a little bit about isocurvature perturbations and non-Gaussianities. So in working um, about dark matter from gravitational particle production, I started with a paper that I wrote with Dan Chung and Tony Riotto in 1998. And there was a paper, an independent paper by Vadim Kuzman and Igor Tikachev in 1999. Since that time, I've had many collaborators working in this general area. And um, I'd like to acknowledge their contribution. Okay. so. Let's take a view of gravitational particle production from a field theory point of view. Now, when you study quantum field theory, you usually study it only in Minkowski space, and you classify particles by their irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. But in an expanding universe is not Poincaré invariant, there's an arrow of time. And so the notion of a particle, the way we usually think of it as an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group is only approximate. So cosmological expansion leads to a time dependent Hamiltonian, which will mix positive and negative frequency modes uh, that we can interpret as particle production. <clears throat> so, we're going to assume that there's a background geometry, a background uh, gravitational field that's produced by inflation. Now, there is a simple inflationary model, it's a quadratic model for an inflaton potential. Uh, it's a simple model. Unfortunately, it's ruled out by CMB measurements, but the CMB measurements probe the inflaton potential 60 or so efolds before the end of inflation. And we'll often be interested where inflation ends when the scalar field is of this value and the CMB will probe the potential when the scalar field is here. Um, so we'll often be interested in what happens when the scalar field is close to the minimum of its potential. So the quadratic description may be a good approximation. I'll also talk about recent studies employing the hilltop potential model for inflation, which may represent alpha attractor inflation and uh, uh, very interesting classes of inflation. And uh, I'll also mention rapid turn inflation models that go by the name of hyperbolic inflation, angular inflation, racetrack inflation, orbital inflation. These are slightly more complicated. They involve two, involve two fields. But for the most part, I will just concentrate on quadratic inflation. So there's an equation of motion for the scalar field um, in quad, in during in the FRW phase, uh, this phi would be the inflaton field at this point. And uh, slow roll during inflation is something that people are familiar with. And you can calculate the energy density and pressure in terms of the time derivative of the inflaton field and its potential. So this is just a graph showing on quadratic inflation how the scalar field, the inflaton field varies with the scale factor. Here, A sub E is the value of the scale factor at the end of inflation. So inflation ends at A over A E of one. So the scalar field, this is a linear log uh, diagram here. 
So the scalar field slowly evolves during inflation, reaches the minimum of the potential at the end of inflation, and then oscillates about the minimum of the potential. The expansion rate is roughly constant during inflation and then decreases roughly like a matter dominated universe after inflation ends, but there are oscillations here due to the os coherent oscillations of the scalar field. And the same thing for the Ricci scalar, the oscillations uh, are not very noticeable here, but there are oscillations in the Ricci scalar at the end of inflation. And again, for quadratic inflation, there's the, an equation of state parameter, the pressure over the energy density during inflation in the quasi desitter phase, it's approximately minus one. And after the end of inflation, it oscillates due to the oscillations in the inflaton field, but it oscillates around the value of zero. So the mean value is, is zero, it behaves like a matter dominated universe. Okay, now let's consider a scalar field that's just a spectator scalar field. It is not contributing to the energy density of the universe. So we have the universe expanding and the dynamics of the expanding universe being controlled by the inflaton field. Now suppose there's an additional scalar field phi. So this Curly phi is not the inflaton, it's some additional scalar field. Well, gravity enters the picture in uh, the covariant action for the scalar field. So it's the square root of minus g, g mu nu, and the possibility of adding dimension four operators involving the Ricci scalar r. And c here would just be some constant. <clears throat> so this is in general. Now, if we specialize to a spatially flat FRW background, and I'm writing this in terms of conformal time eta, then the action uh, is given here. And you notice that the kinetic terms for the action are not the canonical kinetic terms. A squared, the scale factor here, which is a function of eta, is mixed in with the derivatives of the scalar field. But we can do a simple field rescaling and find the action for a canonically normalized scalar field. Uh, and it looks like the usual kinetic terms, an effective mass squared, and a surface term which uh, will go to zero because A times H goes to zero uh, at A to equal to minus infinity and infinity. So the surface term will vanish. The only thing unusual about this action is that the effective mass squared is time dependent. A to is conformal time. It's time dependent as a term that's A squared M squared and a term that's a squared times the Ricci scalar with a factor of one six minus the constant that enters uh, in the action. <clears throat> so cosmological expansion leads to a time dependent background, which leads to a time dependent Hamiltonian for the spectator fields. Now, the solutions to a wave equation that is a wave equation uh, include both positive and negative frequency terms. So I can write some WKB uh, approximation as some coefficient at coefficients alpha and beta. <clears throat> and let's imagine we start with only positive frequency terms. So start with some initial time uh, where this is the solution. Then uh, the second derivative, uh, the wave equation looks like this. And uh, so it's not a solution to the wave equation because of these two terms. So these two terms show that the positive frequency term is not always a solution to the wave equation. You have to develop a negative frequency term. 
So starting with an initial positive frequency term, positive and negative, negative frequency terms <clears throat> will be mixed. And the mixing will depend upon some adiapaticity parameter A, which is uh, the derivative, the conformal time derivative of the um, of omega divided by omega k squared. So if a sub k is much less, <clears throat> much less than one, then positive frequency solutions remain a good solution. If this is larger than one or equal to one, positive and negative frequency terms mix. <clears throat> so again, to visualize this, you can just imagine a harmonic oscillator. Um, if you have a simple harmonic oscillator and you vary slowly the string constant and vary it adiabatically, then the wave function is not going to change. But if the spring constant is very abruptly, not adiabatically, then the wave function will change and we will interpret this as an excited state. So the mixing of the positive and negative frequency turns depends upon this adiapaticity parameter and uh, depends upon the derivative of the dispersion relation. And for the scalar field, we, we can define some dimensionless parameter alpha, which is the value of the scale factor divided by the scale factor at the end of inflation, mu, the mass of the spectator field divided by the expansion rate at the end of inflation, and little h is the expansion rate of the universe divided by the expansion rate of the universe at the end of inflation. So this is the adiabaticity parameter for a scalar field. Again, abrupt changes in the scale factor leads to non-adiabatic changes in the frequency, which adulterates the positive and, and negative frequency modes, leading to particle creation in an expanding universe. And where, where the mode becomes non-adiabatic depends upon whether it's minimally coupled with C equal to zero or conformally coupled with C equal to one six. If C is equal to one six, it becomes non-adiabatic at the end of inflation uh, when modes are sub-Hubble radius. If, uh, it's, if, it's, uh, if it's conformally coupled, if it's minimally coupled, um, where it becomes non-adiabatic depends upon uh, the momentum, how the momentum compares to the scale factor. Now, <clears throat> we have a mode equation, we have an, and then we have to have initial conditions. So as the scale factor goes to zero at early times, omega squared, it goes to k squared. So this motivates the Bunch-Davies or Minkowski initial conditions for the scale for the um, mode function and its derivative. And it's the usual um, solution for the mode function and its derivative. And again, as the scalar field goes, as the conformal, fact, conformal time goes to minus infinity, the physical momentum is much larger than H and the field should not feel the curvature of space time. So you would expect Minkowski initial conditions. And I make no apologies for these in the initial conditions. So the solution to the wave equation generally includes both positive and, and negative frequency terms. And if you start with only outgoing waves, beta is equal to zero. In the evolution, if things become non-adiabatic, then you would produce incoming waves, beta is not equal to zero. And you can go through the calculation of the energy density, et cetera, and the co-moving number density of particles depends upon this Bogliubov co uh, coefficient beta. So I'll often have Na cubed, which is the co-moving number density of the particle. It's uh, just the integral over momentum of beta of k squared. And also it's useful to find the spectral density of the particles produced. 
And that is N sub K, which is one over two pi squared K cubed beta of K squared. So this is uh, an example of, a, of the solution to the mode equations for a conformally coupled scalar, C is equal to one six. And uh, when the mass is, is equal to the expansion rate at the end of inflation. This is a figure showing how the, frequent, how the uh, frequency changes with time. Uh, at early times, omega k squared is just k squared. k is 10 to the minus 2. k squared is 10 to the minus 4. At late times, it grows. Omega k squared grows as a squared. This is the, is the result for the adiabaticity parameter. At early times, when the scale factor is small, it's adiabatic. And at late times, it approaches zero. But there's an intermediate time around the end of inflation when the mode, this mode is non-adiabatic. And this is the spectral density produced as a function of A, the scale factor. And the, you see that's not, you can't call this particle creation yet, but the mode becomes non-adiabatic around the end of inflation when the non-adiabaticity parameter is the largest. <clears throat> so this is a graph showing the spectral density for several values of the mass for conformally coupled scalars. And the important thing that I want to demonstrate here is that it is a blue spectrum by which I mean the spectrum vanishes in the infrared as K goes to zero. So once, so you would calculate the spectral density for each value of K and then integrate to find NAQ, the co-moving number density. And this is the co-moving number density for a scalar field, for a conformally coupled scalar field. And I'll show this also for a Majorana fermion, which is very similar, uh, because for conformally coupled scalar, the conformal symmetry is only broken by the mass term. And since the metric is conformally Minkowski, the massless conformally coupled scalar does not feel expansion. So as the mass goes to zero, there's not going to be particle creation. Now, this is the result for a minimally coupled scalar field and uh, the result for omega k squared. And if the mass is not too large and k is not too large, the Ricci scalar during inflation is negative so omega k squared can be negative. And this will show the region where omega k squared is negative. And when omega k squared is negative, you can have growth, explosive growth in, um, in the mode function. So we have a mode equation. Omega k squared is, can be negative for minimal coupling. So you expect growth. Um, now the question comes up, why should this coupling be constant? There should be an RG flow for C. I won't uh, have any more discussions of that, but we might set C equal to zero or one sixth at some scale, say the Planck mass, but there should be logarithmic corrections. This is the result for minimal coupling for C equal to zero. And um, you see that it's a different result than it is for um, the conformally coupled scalar if C is, if, uh, C is one six. The evolution for the minimally coupled scalar is complicated by two frequency scales, the mass and how the Ricci scalar changes with time. And the important thing to notice here is that for minimally coupled scalars, the spectrum diverges in the infrared if the mass over the expansion rate at the end of inflation is smaller than two. 
So here it's diverging in the infrared in the spectral density. Here it is flat if M over HE is equal to two. And if M over HE is larger than two, then it is not divergent in the infrared. So this is the spectral density of of uh, three values of M over H for minimally coupled scalar compared to what it was for the conformally coupled scalar. And this is M of 0.1. Now, if the spectrum diverges in the infrared, there are isocurvature issues. Now we want to convert the co-moving number density to omega H squared. After inflation, the universe is dominated by coherent oscillations of the inflaton. The energy density decreases as a matter dominated universe. Eventually, the inflaton decays, reheating the universe and uh, evolves as a radiation dominated universe, eventually become matter dominated around Z equal to 30,000, then dark energy dominated again at a redshift of about one. All this time, the co-moving number density remains constant, but comparing it to radiation density and entropy density depends upon the reheat temperature and when inflation ends. So this is the result of doing this calculation for omega H squared, and it depends upon the ratio of the mass of the scalar field divided by the expansion rate at the end of inflation, the expansion rate at the end of inflation, and the reheat temperature. Now, we don't know HE or T reheat, but these are representative choices that you often find in the literature. So using these representative choices, you see that Na cubed of 10 to the minus 5 seems desirable to have omega H squared of 0.12. So for a conformally coupled scalar, this is the result for Na cubed, and 10 to the minus five or so might be a good result. And uh, so this would happen for the mass of the scalar field divided by the expansion rate approximately equal to one within an order of magnitude of one. Now this calculation assumes a particular inflationary model chaotic inflation, which is ruled out, but the general picture holds in other models since the action occurs around the end of inflation. We don't know, but HE of 10 to the 12 and a reheat temperature of 10 to the 9 are commonly used. If stable and dark matter, then the mass would be approximately the expansion rate of the universe at the end of inflation. This could have been anything. Perhaps the inflation scale represents a new physics scale and stable particle at that mass scale would be a natural dark matter candidate. People talk about a WIMP miracle where the mass of the WIMP would be the weak scale. Here it's a WIMPzilla miracle where the mass of the WIMP would be the mass scale of inflation. So inflation indicates a new mass scale. In most models, the inflation mass, the inflaton mass approximately equal to the mass uh, expansion rate during inflation is 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 GeV. Perhaps the expansion rate during inflation will be detectable via primordial gravitational waves. Anyway, I, expect other particles with a mass equal to the mass of the inflaton. Generally, once you have a new mass scale, you have several particles with that mass scale. All of these would be produced by Schrodinger's alarming phenomenon. If the lightest is stable, it would be a dark matter wimpzilla. So this just uh, summarizes what I said before. Again, we want, uh, this is the spectral density for, for minimally coupled scalars. You would have to have the mass smaller than two in order to have it, um, uh, to avoid the isocurvature issues. Uh, if it's conformally coupled, it will always be blue. 
you want 10 to the minus five or so for uh, n sub k. And this will happen again for a conformally coupled scalar around one, for minimally coupled scalars also um, uh, for m over h e of approximately equal to four. So the minimally coupled scalar is not a good dark matter candidate unless it has a mass of about four or five times HE, um, but a conformally coupled scalar is a good dark matter candidate. All right, well, scalar fields aren't the only games in town. What about other particles that you might have? Well, this is the Lagrangian for a real scalar field. How about a Dirac field? And again, if you're in curved space, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, spin one fields, massive spin one fields. Uh, this is the Lagrangian for a De Broglie Broca field involving two possible non minimal coupling to gravity terms. Uh, spin three halves fields would be a Rarita Schwinger field. And spin two fields, massive spin two fields would be a Fierce Pauli field. And people, I've looked at many of these and many other people have also looked at the possibility of Wimpzilla dark matter candidates for these possibilities. I'll just mention the Dirac field, that's very promising. The Dirac equation in FRW for the spinners looks like the Dirac equation in flat space, except for the scale factor dependence. The dispersion relation is the same as a conformally coupled scalar. The adiapaticity parameter is almost the same as a conformally coupled scalar. Uh, it has a blue spectrum. There's no isocurvature issues. So the Dirac Wimzilla is a dark matter candidate. Now, what about fields with spin greater than one half? For bosons, the uh, dispersion relation tells all. This was the dispersion relation for a scalar field for the um, uh, De Broglie Broca field, the uh, plus or minus one helicity field looks like a conformally coupled scalar. For the uh, lambda equal to zero polarization, the dispersion relation is more complicated and it's interesting. Now for spin two fields, uh, the dispersion relation for the plus or minus two helicity states look like a graviton in the massless limit. Uh, it looks sort of simple, looks like a minimally coupled scalar. The lambda equal to plus or minus one polarizations in the SVT polarizations um, is more complicated. And for the uh, lambda equal to zero polarization, the dispersion relation is an incredibly complicated expression that's way too long to show in a, in a transparency. So the De Broglie Proca field is in the FRW background is interesting for the longitudinal modes. And this was pointed out by Graham Martin and Rajendran in 2016, Ahmed and collaborators in 2020, and Andrew Long and I elaborated on it uh, in 2020 also. Um, for the longitudinal modes, the power spectrum is blue tilted at low K negligible power on CMB scale. So there's no problem with iso curvature, even if the mass is much smaller than the expansion rate during inflation. For late reheating, um, you would have a uh, omega H squared for a Wimpzilla. For early reheating, you can have dark matter for a mass as small as a micro electron vote. This was pointed out by Graham, Martin, and Rajendran. And uh, this is an example, just a graph just showing that the longitudinal component is most important. The transverse component of the spin one field is not produced, uh, not produced anywhere near as close as the longitudinal component. 
All right, so I'll have to uh, wrap up. I'll just say a few words about a Fiat's poly field in an FRW background. It was, it should be once thought that massive gravity theories had a ghostly six degree of freedom at the nonlinear level until DRGT showed <clears throat> how to construct ghost-free um, massive spin to gravity. And Hassan and Rosen showed how to construct ghost-free bimetric theories with the correct number of propagating degrees of freedom. <clears throat> we, um, Siang Ling, who's a graduate student of Andrew Long and Rice, and Rachel Rosen, um, and I are examining two massive spin two theories constructed uh, to avoid ghosts and have the correct number of degrees of freedom, mirror matter and doubly coupled. For those of you who work in massive gravity, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> it's a complicated business, uh, but these are the types of Lagrangians we're looking at. We're looking for Wimpzillas, but we found interesting things along the way. Uh, there is a Higuchi bound for massive spin two fields. In 1987, Higuchi demonstrated that in the sitter space, there is a bound on the mass of spin two fields to avoid ghosts that this mass has to be, mass squared has to be larger than 2H squared. We generalized the Higuchi bound to FRW. And um, this is what we have. Again, the Higuchi bound would depend upon uh, epsilon, the slow roll parameter, and it's different in De Sitter, matter dominated and radiation dominated. But there is a cosmological limit on the mass of massive spin two fields in FRW. Uh, Rita Schwinger, I uh, will skip over, even though it's dear to my heart. This says very interesting things happen. Um, it is a more complicated uh, equation than the uh, Dirac equation uh, because there, you, there is a sound speed for the uh, Rarita Schwinger field. And if the sound speed vanishes, um, if the sound speed goes to zero, then you can populate infinite momentum modes and because the frequency is independent of the momentum. So the production of high K modes are unsuppressed. So this would be the um, spectral density as a function of momentum and it's unsuppressed. It just continues to increase. All right, so uh, let me just go to the summary. Uh, gravitational particle production can make dark matter and constrain BSM physics. Dark matter may have only gravitational interaction. That's all we really know about dark matter is that it has gravitational interactions. If that's true, then dark matter must have a gravitational origin. Cosmological gravitational particle production through Schrodinger's alarming phenomena is a promising way to make dark matter in the correct abundance, avoiding other constraints, even if it only interacts with standard model particles gravitationally. For scalars, conformally coupled scalars are a promising dark matter candidate if the mass is approximately equal to the expansion rate at the end of inflation. This is the Wimpzilla miracle. I don't think minimally coupled is the promising dark matter candidate. If there's late reheating, omega H squared is much too large unless the mass is larger than a few HE. Early reheating, again, the same result. There's isocurvature constraints, again, unless the mass is larger than a few times HE. Dirac fermions are similar to conformally coupled scalars, promising dark matter candidate, again, if the mass is approximately equal to HE. De Broglie Proca vectors can be a dark matter candidate if it's very light. Micro electron votes are very massive. Rarita Schwinger fermions could have catastrophic production if the sound speed vanishes. 
And this may have implications for models of supergravity. Fierce polytensors, there's a FRW generalization of the Higuchi bound and the dark matter relic abundance calculations are in progress. Now I've gone up to spin two. Alexander Jenks and McDonald had looked at spins greater than two and this is something for future work. So I have a question to leave you with. What do we make of a quantum field theory that is perfectly reasonable in Minkowski space, but pathological in the expanding universe? Example would be Fierce Pauli or spin two fields with a small mass. These would be path pathological in FRW, but perfectly normal in Minkowski space. All right, so I had to rush through a little bit at the end, but coming soon to a review or modern physics near you is a, is a review I'm writing with Andrew Long, Cosmological Gravitational Particle Production and its Implications for the Origin of Dark Matter. So uh, thank you very much. I'll stop now because I've um, gone on for an hour and I'd be happy to elaborate on any uh, things that I rushed over. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So now it's time for question. So any questions? Okay, uh, thanks for good talk. Um, my question, maybe that I am asking you a comment about the stability of such massive particles. Even though it's once produced, its mass is so heavy, and then even though it has a gravitational interaction, I think uh, well, it will decay within the second, I think. So, well, that, yes, that, that, that's a good point. So, I have <clears throat> implicitly assume that the particle is stable. Yeah. Now, it only has gravitational interactions with standard model particles, but even if it's very massive, even these, um, if it's only gravitational interactions by um, uh, um, graviton exchange or something, you could imagine it decaying. So there has to be some other symmetry that you have to uh, 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 impose to ensure that it's stable. So that's a very good point. You have to ensure that this dark matter particle would be stable. And, yeah. But you know, the, the same type of thing comes up for uh, other dark matter candidates. You, even though it's massive, you have to assume that something keeps it stable. That's a good point. Thank you, I should have mentioned that. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, hello? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So I have a question. So uh, you mentioned uh, about no cautionality, but uh, probably uh, running out of time, so you didn't manage elaborate. So what's the problem? Is there any uh, issues with this uh, no causality. Okay, let me uh, let me go back to sharing my screen. Am I sharing my screen? Uh, no, I cannot see your screen. Okay, so let me go up here and share the screen. And now we can see your screen, yeah. Okay, so this is a, a program that's keeping me busy probably for the rest of my life. Uh, looking at the one point function as a function of various types of fields for dark matter, that's just the one, po one point function, the isocurvature fluctuations are the two point function and CMB non-Gaussianities would be the three point function. 
And uh, the only work on this has been done by Dan Chung and his student at Wisconsin U for the massive scalar field. So, you know, they found not particularly interesting constraints due to CMB non-Gaussianities. I think you would have to have a red spectrum to have um, interesting non-Gaussianities but it really hasn't been uh, explored here. So there's a lot of open space. Uh, it's a very good question. I wish I knew the answer to, uh, <laughs> to this very good question. Okay, thank you. So people are pointing out that I have a lot more work to do. Any other question? Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. And uh, in the middle of your uh, talk, the, in the one slide, you are mentioning that the gravitational production is universal, if I remember correctly. And there was a comment about file symmetry. Yes. In the bottom of the uh, world. What was it about? I, I missed okay. the chance to yeah. talk about that. Yes. Yeah, I, I glossed over it. I think I mentioned it very quickly, but if you blink, you probably missed it. Um, so the spatially flat FRW is um, conformally equivalent to Minkowski. Yeah. So the metric is just A squared times something that looks like Minkowski space. Mm -hmm. So if the coupling of this spectator field is conformal, then it will not feel the expansion of the universe in the mode equations. Okay. So somehow you have to break this vile conformal symmetry invariance. So an mm. example would be a photon is conformally coupled so you would not produce photons during uh, by this process. If you want to produce mm -hmm. photons, you have to break vial conformal invariance in its coupling somehow. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, one more question. So you, you are considering, <clears throat> for example, massive spin one, spin three half, spin two, et cetera, right? With the right. non-zero mass for those, mm -hmm. basically for that reasons. And in the... Uh, in the Minkowski uh, quantum field theory, the uh, whenever you talk about uh, ma massive spin one or spin three half, etc., you have to actually uh, provide the generate mass generation mechanism for those particles, right? Unless right. otherwise, you will have a unitarity violation problem. Yes. Uh, so, so, so for yes, thank you. So for massive spin one you can mm. do the Stuckelberg trick and mm. uh, you know, assume there's, there's some different scales. Mm. So people usually handle the massive spin one fields that way. Mm -hmm. um, for the massive spin three halves, then um, the usual explanation involves supergravity uh, and then the, the massive spin three halves field inherits all of the good qualities of the gravitons. And so you don't have to worry about it. And for the massive spin two field, I don't think it's a problem. Oh, okay. so, you, so you're correct. You have to, you have to build these uh, higher spin theories within some larger framework. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a very good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> other questions? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, that uh, diversity and related to people one's uh, um, question about the conformal symmetry, um, it's, well, nevertheless, it's a flat cut symmetry and anyway broken by quantum corrections, yes. like through the renovation group branding of couplings. Uh, does it, um, does it have any effect on the gravitational production, like for instance, the gauge, gauge boson or conformal couple of scalars? 
Well, that's, um, you know, that's a good point. And I glossed over that again because of time. But if you just look at, for instance, a conformally coupled scalar field, uh, that would require in the notation C equal to one sixth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there should be RG corrections to that, right? Mm -hmm. So that depends upon mm -hmm. scale. That's the quantum mm -hmm. effects that you have in mind. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> those quantum effects are usually ignored in thinking that they're small effects. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they should be studied more. So, you know, that, that's a very good point. I see. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, can uh, I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very good talk. But it will be a very basic, basic question, but though, uh, I know that the uh, frequency of mode function is negative, then the particle interpretation is not possible. Then how can I accept the notion of the number density, for example, of those yes. particles? Yes. So while the evolution is non-adiabatic, so you can, uh, let me back up. You can really only define a particle if the evolution is adiabatic. So in the er very early time, in the beginning of inflation, the evolution is adiabatic. At the end of inflation, in the matter, deep in the matter dominated phase, the evolution becomes adiabatic again. In the intermediate phase, as your intuition tells you, it's not adiabatic. And the definition of a particle, well, you shouldn't think of the things as, a, as, as particles. So you can really only define a particle in the, in the adiabatic phases. That doesn't mean that so things happen. So I, I don't, I shouldn't call it the particles. And when I say production of particles, you produce excitations in the field that eventually, when it becomes adiabatic, you can interpret as particles. Mm -hmm. did, did that help? Okay, we have help. Thank you very much. Well, th uh, thanks everybody for very good questions. I have one very nice question. So in the gravitational production, I think I thought the, the concept of horizon is really important. Yes. And this then in Schwinger effect, there is kind of some analogous concept of horizon. So the, the horizon is important. It, it, so if you think of the Schwinger effect, yeah. uh, you have to accelerate the particles to be relativistic over a Compton wavelength of the distance of a Compton wavelength of the particle. So you have to, you have, to have enough energy to, for the particle to be relativistic, to have the velocity approximately equal to C. And in the expanding universe, the horizon is where the velocity is equal to C. So in analogy with the Schwinger effect, you would expect the horizon to enter, or the Hubble radius more exactly, to enter. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, the, the uh, Hubble radius enters everywhere. Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions? If not, let's thank speakers again. Thank you very much for a nice Thank talk. you. I, I enjoyed the evening here and uh, your morning. Thank you very much for the very nice questions and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.